Okay, where to begin? All right, so um, let me first um, introduce our invited panelists. Um, Alia Sebti is the artistic director at the fifth Marrakesh Biennial and a curator specializing in contemporary art in North Africa. Um, she has also worked on Perry Photo and Marrakesh Art Fair and has initiated and co-curates the Art to East cycle of exhibition on Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. And then also today we're very fortunate to have with us Gabrielle Salgado. Um, she's a co-curator co -curator of La Autre Biennale in Bogota. She's Argentinian based in London and has worked um, as a curator of public programs at Tate, Tate Modern, um, has done extensive work linking artists and art institutions between Central and South America and in Africa, and also curated Praxis um, Art in Times of Uncertainty, the second biennial of Saloniki in 2009. So maybe I thought we could start by each of you presenting your, each of your biennials, give us some you know, background and context. Alia, do you want to start? The Marrakesh Biennial will be at its fifth edition. We are starting on the 26th of February 2014, and it covers a range of several aspects. We are on visual art, on literature, performing art, cinema video, and we also address the topic of architecture. The Biennale started in 2004 as a very small, intimate event with around 3,000 people on visual art and literature. And then, more and more, it started to grow, to open up to different aspects of art. And the last one that happened in 2012, we had 54,000 people all around in Marrakech on the visual art, on literature, and on cinema. We have one curator per discipline, and we ask each of them to have a very good understanding of the context of Marrakech. And then we work on the articulation between those disciplines. So it's not hermetical events that are not connected to the other one, it's always the biennial as a dialogue. So a dialogue amongst the curator, the dialogue amongst the participants, the dialogue among the artists, and that's what we try to reach for the next edition of the Marrakech Biennial. Thank you for coming. Uh, La Otra Biennale, uh, to give you a context, started as a parallel art fair to Arbo, which is a very important Biennale um, art fair in Latin America and is growing every year to, to become one of the main fairs uh, outside of Europe and the United States. Um, for six editions, it was that. It was a parallel art fair. And uh, then, uh, two years ago, the director decided to make it into an event that would reach out and invite artists to do interventions in three neighborhoods in Bogota. So in fact, it has become an exhibition of public art of interventions in the neighborhoods of La Macarena, El Bosque Izquierdo, and La Perseverancia, which are three very um, uh, close neighborhoods in terms of geography. They're one next to the other, but in terms of socioeconomics, they are completely apart because one is, is very marginal and very poor. The middle one is being gentrified mainly by artists and shops that are uh, making it um, a, a chic area of town. It's middle class, but it's becoming more and more chic. And the last one, the Bosque Izquierdo, is a very, very elegant, very high class neighborhood. And they're very close, but they don't talk to each other. So the idea of the La Otra Biennale, which means the other one, in a very um, humorous way, it refers to La Otra as La Otra, the other woman, um, like the, the illegitimate wife, <laughs> Ill illicit wife. Um, that um, exhibition that we curated for the first time with other three curators, we are four, um, myself from Argentina, curator from Guatemala, one from Peru, and one from Colombia, decided to invite international artists and local artists to intervene these spaces in the city and create bridges between neighborhoods and between art and the general public who don't normally go to exhibitions or um, art fairs. So one, one of the conceptual access for, for the Biennale was um, there has been a very intensive protest against Monsanto in Colombia and there's been a lot of problems with agriculture and, 
uh, people in the countryside um, trying to keep their seeds and not be monopolized. So all that was used as one of the axes to think about how we treat food and the, the trade of seeds and agricultural products. So we did a lot of projects with food. We did a lot of projects that included artist talks and banquets and cooking processes. We, did, uh, uh, we created a newspaper. We made interventions on walls, like you're seeing here with uh, Mexican artist Demian Flores, who conducted uh, himself, didn't paint anything, but conducted work on a, on a wall in this very uh, poor neighborhood where there were lots of rappers and graffiti artists. So we use local talent in order to create confidence in the possibility of art being uh, employed for communication. Um, this is a work by Muataz Nasser, is an artist from Egypt who was invited to Bogota to reproduce one of his emblematic maize pieces. These mazes um, are made of uh, Kuni calligraphy, they're, they're text-based, and they include the slogans of Tahir Square when the Egyptian revolution started in 2011. So this piece was reproduced in Bogota. And it had to do with the situation of the countryside and the agricultural struggles. So in a way, this is the finalized piece, uh, as he as was at the end. Um, so the, What does it say? He says, peace, bread, and social justice. So it's a very simple but very universal claim. And it could work in any other context. This is Muataz Nasser giving a talk at university, talking about his work. We did a lot of talks. We did a lot of film programs. Um, music-based events. Um, we, we run across mediums. This is the work of um, René Francisco. Am I going too long now? You want me to stop? Maybe, actually, maybe we should yeah, um, get into talking about these specific biennials. Um, my idea of bringing you two together was to talk about biennial biodiversity, that in the context of biennials, since um, when you mentioned the word biennial, one of the first people, thing people says is, oh my god, there's so many biennials. But like, in nature, biodiversity is a variation, a variety, excuse me, of species or genetics. And the more variation there is inside of um, an ecosystem, the more healthy it is. So looking at the culture of biennials and saying, inside this, what kind of different biennials are there? And, uh, what roles do they play and uh, to the different communities because you know they're uh, they're in so many different parts of the world and so I thought it might be interesting to um, look at that in the context of um, you know other biennials as well um, the the Marrakesh biennial has 80 participants 35 of which are artists uh, La Otra Biennial had about 50 is that right about 68 68 and to just give you a little context of other, other biennials, the Whitney Biennial that's coming up has a little more than 100. Istanbul just had 80. Sao Paulo, 110. Venice Biennial had about 150. And Documenta, 180. So there's all different kinds of audiences and scale, scales that are, that are going on. But um, one thing that I thought was really interesting in the differentiation between biennials is that some of them have between the actual program and exhibition and education programs. In addition, they do things, some of them, between the biennials. And then you guys are both people that have, in, in between biennials, there's things going on. So I thought maybe we could talk a little about what it is, why you do it, you know. For the Marrakesh Biennial, the whole approach is um, to get rid of the event-based. So the biennial is a starting point from which to start developing until the next edition of the biennial. It's always growing very organically and always trying to keep this human size. So for instance, between the last edition of the biennial and the next one, we created what we call the satellite events that are dedicated to putting a network or revealing the network between what happens in the Mediterranean Sea, for instance, a project with the Villa Romana where we had together artists from southern part of the Mediterranean Sea with curator from the northern part of the Mediterranean Sea, all together doing residency project that will be shown then during the biennial, a book that will be shown during the biennial, 
Um, there is this cycle of ex exhibition with Arte East. And then what we also try to do is to have either workshops or meeting moments. We started in January 2013, the research trip of each artist who came and who are doing their production in December. So we have one year dedicated to the, um, another like a long lasting approach of the biennial. Because all the time the artists are there, they meet people, they meet the cultural key players, they meet uh, the craftsmen, they meet the students, they meet together, and it's a long lasting process. That's how we try to do that. And we also put a big uh, importance for the educational program, but that we are working on that to developing it further. Can you talk some more about the residency program, the north and south of the Mediterranean? It Yes, this, this residency program is one of these uh, satellite events. And uh, by, by putting together one curator with one artist, creating this uh, spontaneous couple and discussing about the theme, which is the theme of the overall biennial for the next edition, where are we now? So it's also uh, where am I now, me as an artist within my practice and uh, with the confrontation or dialogue with the curator who brings a theoretical aspect of it. Where am I now in the southern part of the Mediterranean Sea? What does it mean for me um, to travel or uh, to have the, not the same uh, access to travel and mobility to discuss about that? And, um, and where am I as a curator interested in maybe uh, some specific art scene in North Africa, how to develop it further? So it's always creating pretext to put the seed and to have developing further for the next edition all the time. And then um, we had talked about also, um, you have an approach that's more of like a laboratory approach to your biennial. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yes, in fact, what, what Alia was saying about, you know, the, the, the aspect of um, creating relationships is crucial to these events, because otherwise we're parachuting in different cities around the world, replicating a model everywhere uh, that doesn't work everywhere in the same way. And that, to me, is not interesting as a, as a curator. I, I really want to, to test different modes of making uh, cultural events, exhibitions, because an exhibition is a cultural event that lasts for a period of time, but make it last longer by creating relationships. I can give examples of Latin American biennales that are, have done that through programs that are extensive, like the, Porto, the Mercosul Biennale in Porto Alegre in southern Brazil started employing uh, very interesting pedagogues, like Luis Kamnitzer is an artist from Uruguay who is also a, a brilliant writer and pedagogue, has taught in New York for the last 40 years in universities and has a very interesting approach to teaching. And he was commissioned to do an educational program for the Biennale that goes in between Biennales, is, is continuous. So the, the teachers of schools and, and uh, lecturers in universities are invited to work with artists in between the Biennales. So they work with the artists that will come to the next one, preparing the program with them. And that I find it very interesting because it's not about just the, the show or the object that you are going to see, but the actual process of thinking about a subject matter or a question that the artist might bring in with the work. So that, for me, is a very good formula. The, the San Paolo Biennale that Lisa Chilanyado curated in, it was, not, it was two Biennales ago, uh, so it was 2010 to eight was uh, t entitled How to Live Together. And she was trying to tackle the same question. Uh, uh, is art living together with society? Or we are, we are confining art to certain spaces? And to me, that is not interesting. I definitely want to, to tackle that in my project. Can you talk, tell, tell the audience about the, um, the printmaking a workshop that you were telling me about the other day? This is, this is, for instance, a, a workshop that we did with Nathalie Mbabikoro. It's an artist from Gabon, uh, based in Berlin, uh, who was invited to do workshops, printmaking workshops. And we work with different types of public. Uh, we, we work with students, art students from university, a private university in Bogota, and neighbors from this neighborhood that um, I mentioned before that has 
a very, um, it's very stigmatized, very problematic image in Bogota because people think that only criminals live there. And it's not true. When you enter a neighborhood, you realize that people are people everywhere. And of course, there is more crime in certain areas because of poverty or certain social tensions. But people are eager to participate in events and workshops and learn. And they were very, very engaged in this uh, printing workshop. Um, we also did that mural project with a Mexican artist, and that was another oc occasion for us to work across different generations and, and different sectors of society. So that was very enjoyable. That's great. And this sort of links to um, another thing that uh, both of your biennials share is commissioning new projects. Um, can you talk a little bit about like how you decide when an artwork should be commissioned and what the funding structure is, and then um, maybe site specificity, if that's a concern or an inter... So for, uh, for this edition of the Marrakech Biennale, the last one we had 36 artists participating. And amongst them, we had still more than 90% who were commissioning pieces, who were being commissioned. For this one, we have had so far 27 artists. And, uh, and then we will have existing pieces, maybe five maximum of it. So it's very, very focused. The visual art exhibition is very much focused on commissioning and site-specific pieces. The whole process of that is, um, first, we made a lot of research of the story we want to tell about Marrakech, or uh, the, its history, its geography, its topography. And each artist who is invited to make his research trip has a beautiful present of that amount of things to read. And then from that on, he comes to Marrakech and he's just receiving so many information in the same time. But after that, he has some weeks or months to let all of that come down. And he, propose, he writes his proposal. That's how we do. Then we have the proposal. And then we start a second trip that is dedicated to the production. Why, how did you guys decide to, do, to be so heavy on the commissioning side? Because um, it's about understanding the context. A biennial is so connected to its environment where it's happening. If it's not site specific, you used a very beautiful term before, you said parachute. It's just there and it arrives out of the blue. Where you have site specific pieces that are taught for that, it, is, it creates a deep connection with the, with the place, so with the space. That's why for the, for the theme, it's where are we now? The first word is where. First we ground it, then we create a connection with it. And then it's we, so the artists who are invited to participate, how do they react to the space, how, and also how do they, re they react to the people, the collectivity, this immediate environment, how do we talk to them? And when I say, when, how do they talk to them? It's uh, not only international artists who come from the first time in Marrakech. It's not that at all. It's, it's all of that. Being one artist from Marrakech who discovers the city in a very different way. By putting contemporary art in the building of the 16th century, you discover it from another angle. Uh, by having one artist from Casablanca coming from the first time and discovering the whole history of why we have this space that is made like this and why we put it in connection with this. And also it's artists who come for the first time in Morocco and the first time in Marrakech. We help them navigate to that. We pre-select some venues, but then it's on them to, cho to choose where they want to, uh, to intervene amongst these venues. For us also worked in that sense, in the sense that we, research was done on the main spaces of the city that needed to be activated or could be used for, for artists to intervene. Not only international artists were commissioned, also local artists were commissioned. Mostly local artists were commissioned. I brought eight artists who were all international. Um, my uh, Guatemalan uh, colleague brought uh, 15 artists from Central America. Uh, the Peruvian curator brought a few artists from Peru and worked locally with Colombian artists. And then the Colombian curator obviously worked with Colombian artists. So the majority, or let's say over 50%, were Colombian artists who knew the city and wanted to do something specific for it. 
the other thing that you mentioned as well that I found very valuable is that you create connections between local and international artists and international artists and local artists with manufacturers, with producers in the city who normally are, work outside the arts and get involved as artisans or or makers of, of like industrial makers, like when we had to go and make a vinyl prints for Sami Baloji's uh, Congolese artist photographer uh, installation, and they had never printed uh, an artwork. So that, that exchange was interesting for me too. So you create connections in many levels that are not just audience artists, but producers, manufacturers, technicians, artisans, and the publics, of course, and the, and the students and all the people who get involved. Yeah, it really radiates out. And, and then um, sometimes funding structures affect commissioning possibilities. Sometimes commissioning you know, affects the funding, like being able to fundraise or not. Like, how do you see that, that dialogue going back and forth between funding and commissioning? Commissioning is very complex and is a, is, is a risky operation. You never know what you're going to get. And, and when you start with a commission, it changes. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't happen. Sometimes it happens in a way that you don't expect. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's very satisfactory. Um, in, the term, in terms of financing it, and, well, that is where the risk is because most of the time it goes over budget. Uh, because people calculate according to their parameters where they live and work, and when they go to a new place, they have to rethink budgets or things, you know, change in the course of making um, because they don't work the way that the artists can see before, especially if they come from another country where they work with different materials, manufacturing conditions, etc. So, you know, it's risky, but but you need to have funding in place with with a lot of contingencies, margins. To, to be able to, to meet the demands of, of commissioning. It's exciting, though. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. I agree. But Ali, do you think that sometimes it's easier to fundraise for new commissions than to fundraise to like ship a work from far away or something like that? It depends. It really, really depends. For, uh, for each artist participating, for each piece that is being commissioned, it's very, very uh, conjunctural. So, so we can't all the time say it's easier to find the funding for an existing piece just to ship it to Morocco or uh, to, uh, to have one commission piece. It's true that uh, it's always there is this huge margin of error, but by putting the biannual as a, it's, it's an experimentation, it's a laboratory, and we, we invite artists to be part of it, to, um, to try, to try it's the best way, the, the best response possible to the context. And that's also why I think it can be also most interesting for funding-wise to have sponsor for this. But uh, we try to frame it as well. Yeah. It's not the yeah. artist who comes and say, I'm, I'm going to have exactly this project and it's going to cost that amount. It's what can we do without, uh, within that frame. So it helps us to, uh, to, yeah, to have something against this margin. But also, I think that one element in artistic practice that is the most, uh, one of the most um, uh, conducive to interesting works is, is risk taking, but it's also uncertainty. I mean, having to be flexible, having to change your mind about something that you thought was one way, and suddenly you need to find solutions to make it happen in different ways. I think that that nurtures all as human beings, as intellectuals, as artists, to, to have less certainty is good sometimes. I mean, of course, it's, it's, it's tricky, but it's good. I want to pull on something you said earlier when you were talking about um, it depends on what kind of story we want to tell. And um, you were telling me about um, the history of oral tradition in, in Morocco and how that um, became an aspect of what the biennial is trying to achieve and the way they're trying to achieve it. Can you talk about that a little bit? It is, um, it is definitely in, in the culture of, uh, of Marrakech. You have the main space that is called uh, La Plaza Malfna, where you have storytellers. We have the beautiful piece from the last edition by Katia Camelli, who filmed this storyteller, who was telling a, a film, a contemporary film, and uh, she was playing between the different uh, translations within this video installation. And 
we try to do that with another aspect for the next edition, the, another uh, homage to the oral uh, legacy mm -hmm. um, by sound art, having a lot, lot, lot of sound art pieces moving around in the city, so not connected only to one space, but by being there, diffuse this transmission of oral. There is one of the examples, for instance, we will have um, in the taxi within the city, people who go there, take a cab, and try to go from one place to another one. It's sound pieces happening in the taxi. This is one of the example of the contemporary uh, homage to the oral legacy of the city. Yeah. And then the radio station. We will have, uh, it, this project is made by the radio station, the South Radio, oh, okay. yeah, it's okay. one of these projects. Because you have a radio station yeah. in the Ultra Biennales. Yeah, we had a radio station where we had artists explaining their, their pieces and conversations between curators and artists. And that was also a way to keep, you know, the Biennale fresh and always being, you know, broadcasting new material. We had a newspaper, but also we had taxis with uh, sound pieces. <laughs> we had Andri Salas piece uh, for, for taxis that he did in other cities around the world. We brought it in. And we had an Indian artist from Bombay um, who brought, um, actually she customized a local form of rickshaw, which is moto taxi yeah. with, with a little motorbike. Yeah. It's, it's not pedaled. And she made it into an Indian rickshaw with the Indian aesthetics and put soundtrack from Bombay inside. So it was a total like dislocation running that rickshaw. But it's true, taxi drivers in many cities function as like the transmitters because when you get in a taxi and you ask them what's really going on, they know everything that's happening and they, t and they tell everybody. Yeah. It's fantastic. Um, so, um, wait a minute. Audio. Ah, you, you used a really interesting phrase that I thought we should kind of go back to this thing about, you said parachuting is dangerous. Yeah. And um, one thing that the, you guys both talked about is really trying to integrate a lot of research and field work into the dialogue between the foreign and the local participants. Um, is it, what, what is the best possible effects of connecting local and um, international, you know, audiences, artists, and everything. And is there a way? Poss is it possible for biennials to guide it in a way that's going to be mutually beneficial? Is it possible? Can you do it? How would you do it? Mm, or just the, the biennial in, in any aspect of what they do. Connecting the local and, and the international. international, either the audiences, the artists, yeah. or the you know, the writers, or you know, because yeah. this was where there's always contention or concerns. There are different ways how we try to approach it is how, first of all, you connect the international practitioners with the local. And by local is the local artist, the local students, and then the local audience. Not as an order of priority, but uh, chronologically. First, it's uh, connecting local artists and international artists. Then local and international artists with local students, and then the local and international participants with the local audience. And um, creating this relationship with the local audience is the biggest challenge, but also the most interesting part of a whole biennial. How do we go, uh, how do you bring this local audience? And for that, we have created this new discipline, which is performing art. It is happening in the public space. It is creating a circulation within the public space to just go and grasp the attention, the curiosity, and invite people to come to the Biennale. Another example is through sound art by happening within the city, just to, to bring these people who are interested in art, but especially who are not interested in art, to bring the students to create a moment where there is um, an attention, a curiosity towards the Biennale. The connection between local and international is also made through a discursive part. We completely address that in the literature program. It's uh, through workshop, round table. The answer of the curator of the question, where are we now, is the lo to the local, the global, and the universal. And that's this whole subthematic that he's going to develop further. So it is definitely something that we are working on and is very important. 
I think basically what we need to bear in mind is we live in a, in a connected world. We are obsessed with connectivity. We are obsessed with communication. Social media is giving us access to things happening all around the world all the time. In that context, art, contemporary art plays different roles. It's not the same as 20 years ago or 10 years ago even before Facebook. So we are, we are creating situations that can be witnessed from the distance through the social media, which is great. Communication is important. Artists connect like that. People connect like that. We know where we are. We know where we're going to see, and we share it. But it's also about depth of experience. For me, what, what matters is that you have a, 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 an encounter with, with the performance, with the film, with sound, with whatever you encounter in the city without looking for it, and that, that creates some kind of effect that is deeper than the, the photograph or the I was here. Uh, for me, it's important that there is some kind of reaction or, or a memory that stays there, that sediments, that, that creates some kind of connection. And if that responds to, to your question of connectivity and how that is relevant, I think it's very important to create meaningful experience. Otherwise, experience just for the sake of experience and f to create one more show in a different city with the same parameters is not interesting. Um, there, um, I mean, it would never happen, but like if there was, it was possible to have a biennial that only had artists from that city and the visitors were only visitors from that city, would it be a biennial? Yes, of course, why not? What do you think? I mean, it wouldn't be the model that we know, but yeah. it, would be, it would be like a, well, in Latin America, sorry, in Latin America there is this model called salon, like this, but <laughs> is the, the, like in the French tradition, 19th century French like tradition, a, Like salon. a more intimate house. So where you have, yeah, but well, where you have local artists presenting the latest work every year, and it gets judged by its quality, and it gets, you know, given a prize or whatever. And that is a local model for what now we call, or since the Venice Biennale, which is the, is the mother of all Biennales, called the Biennale. But originally, those exhibitions were local and they were salons. And in Latin America, they still exist. We're very yeah. old-fashioned. In some cities, <laughs> they exist. In Colombia, they have the Salon Nacional, which this year was made into an international salon. So it was, it was perverted. It was converted into a kind of semi-biennale. Yeah. Yeah. We're saying, oh yeah, go. I think it, it exists, but it's also a pity to miss these bridges between local and international. And these encounters, and uh, it still can be. For instance, the Dakar Biennial, it's not city-based, but it's more uh, region-based. So they have only participants from Africa. Africa, we're talking about 54 countries, so it's something quite large. Um, with still local and international audience. So we, we miss one of the biggest characteristics of the Biennale, is this encounter, this confrontation and dialogue that happens in between. But still, it can happen. I mean, I feel like you can't even go out to dinner without being at a table that has all diff people from different parts of the world. So how can you have an art exhibition? It's just part of the naturalness. But so then in that way, then maybe um, inherent in biennials is this the issues of foreignness, like w misunderstandings, like are inherent in foreignness. So maybe misunderstanding is creating an uh, area for misunderstandings is part of what it is to make a biennial. Well, it's very good that you mentioned Dakar because this is a Biennale that I, I'm, it's very dear to me because it's a very special event. It's, it's, a, it's a Biennale in Africa that has already 20 years of existence. It started in 91, and it is a Pan-African event. So what, in that sense, for, um, the sense of foreignness exists yeah. because uh, it's a large continent and the communications are not that great. So. But it's the same in Latin America. We look more at Paris and London and New York than to the neighbors. And, and in Africa, it's the same. Artists tend to go more to the West and travel in the continent. So if you bring to Senegal an artist from South Africa and an artist from Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, whatever, I mean, they don't meet unless they go there. So it is a very important event for people to meet. Can you talk a little bit about how you started having this cross-pollination 
like what inspired you, what the origins were, and then kind of where you're at with it now? Because I think that's very interesting. Well, well, I went to Dakar Biennale in 2008 for the first time, and I was impressed by the familiarity that I, I felt so familiar with the, with the environment and with the discussions and the way of thinking about our place in, in the contemporary art scene. Um, and I thought, well, it's very similar, although Latin American art has been distributed more widely. It's, it's easily understood because of its relations with the European avant-garde traditions. It's a similar god. It's, it's, it's a very similar um, art history in a way, and, and the aesthetics are more uh, palatable to the Western eye than African art, which is more rooted in, in traditions that are not, in a way, haven't been so polluted by the West. It's the same with Asian art. It's very difficult, unless you are copying Western art as an Asian art, it's very difficult to understand those traditions because art, art histories are not connected. It's a very long topic. I'm not going to bore you, but yeah. the, basically I was interested in that when I got there for the first time and started inviting African artists to go to Latin America and, and vice versa to create this cross-pollination because we need to talk to each other directly without having to pass through the, ba the main capitals. And has it changed the dialogue, you think? It's changing. I mean, already the, the connections within our continents are changing and are improving. We are seeing more um, continental uh, initiatives that gather and people, like in form of residences, people are circulating more in Latin America and in Africa. And I think that the challenge for me, the, the excitement is in, in crossing, uh, going from one side to the, yeah. the ocean to the other yeah. and, and start dialogues with our, with our colleagues the other side. I have done a lot of that already in the last five years. I've been going to North Africa and to West Africa. And, Artists who I, I found there are coming to Latin America. There were four artists from Africa in, in Bogota. I did a residency in Brazil this year and in Colombia with African artists. So that's ongoing. And are you finding similar kind of um, between North Africa and Middle Eastern nations? or For, a, for instance, the connection between um, South America and Africa that's also what we do. For instance, we have one of the participating artists who is coming from Mexico, who develops a whole project with the, the carpets um, with the craftsmen from Morocco. And there are a lot, lot, lot of uh, similar approach or uh, interesting exchanges between the cultural scene in South America and the one in Africa, definitely. We also um, connect with different regions North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. As you were saying with the example of the Dakar Biennial, it's, a, it's very much a pity. But when we are in Morocco, we need to travel to Paris or to London or Berlin to meet people from uh, Algeria or from Kenya and, um, and never in Africa, never. And we, we have to stop only this monothematic triangular way to talk to each other. There are a lot of initiatives putting people together, but we should also be able to do that um, in another alternative way, in a more horizontal way. So that's also what we do with the, with the Biennale, is connecting with South America, but also as a priority within Africa, the North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. But even not only in the, in the cultural sector, to travel. I, I was in Algeria, I had to go to Nigeria from North Africa to West Africa, I had to go back to Paris to change planes. Mm. So this is what makes it difficult. You know, travel is not easy yet. And, and in the continent. Expensive. Expensive. By commerce, mm. anyway. Um, just to so, kind of start to wrap it up and um, talk about biennials and the kind of, all this organic flexibility and um, different approaches. Um, there, um, Massimiliano Gioni wrote a text called In Defense of Biennials, and there's something positive that I pulled out of it that I thought I could present to you guys and maybe ladies and see how, um, if you think your biennial is doing that or if what, you know, in what way. And he says that actually there is a truly liberating aspect to the way biennials have mushroomed in the 1990s, and it is that today there is no single pattern. The proliferation has done away with any illusion of unity, like within biennials. And then he goes on to say that um, 
biennials around the world, all they have in common is the fact that there are exhibitions held every two years. I'm sorry if this definition is a bit vague and simplistic, but it's the only one that really applies to hundreds of very different shows we call biennials. Unlike other artistic institutions, biennials, precisely due to their temporary nature, are at least theoretically wide open to change and innovation. They are flexible tools that are just waiting to be reinvented and transformed with each new edition. Yeah. Is this something that, that clearly... Yeah, it's funny because I have friends who are not from the art world and ask me, so you're doing the next edition too? Like they think that a curator of a Biennale is always the same. And it's not, and the, that is, that is the, 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 the part that for me is more exciting, that every edition presents an opportunity to create a new form of working yeah. with artists. I mean, not that there is a lot of differences between many Biennales, they're kind of similar formats. So I'm interested in, in, in new ways of working with Do you with think it's possible to make new formats inside the biennial structure? Well, you can at least try to reach out in different ways, in more creative ways. You can, you can employ the time-based nature of, of, of the Biennale just as a, as, as a pole of attraction, but not as the main goal. So you can create, like we were discussing before, longer term relations between the events mm -hmm. or institutions that are engaged with the Biennale during the year in between, uh, schools, universities like you did, we discussed with Porto Alegre, mm -hmm. the Mercosur Biennale. Um, I think there are many ways of doing it and, and you know, each of them is interested in its own terms. But definitely is, is um, the fact that it has sprouted all over the world and there are cities that are not even known for anything else but for the Biennale. Like there are cities that people would have never thought or dreamt of going to unless there was a, a contemporary art Biennale. That is already quite fascinating. I mean, there are places around the world that you say, you know, sometimes, where, where is this? And there is a Biennale. <laughs> so you end up going there yeah. and discovering a new place. So, Which you know, there is, it's interesting. But then um, you're coming from a totally different position because you're the artistic director and you are there consecutively over at different editions. Do you try to change it? Each edition is a way to improve it, to improve the model. And there is a, an infinity of models. And um, for each one, it's where do you put the goal? Where is your, uh, your priority? Who do you want to reach? How? Through the educational program, uh, through uh, the literature, through the visual art. It, there is an infinity of elements. But there is also something else that you were saying that is very important is the impact of a biennial in the city. Those cities that are known only for a biennial, well, the biennial is an amazing tool to help people discover the city and to help people discover the legacy, the cultural legacy of this city. So yes, for each one, for each edition of the Marrakech Biennial, we try to uh, get rid of the aspect of Marrakech as the Republic of Spa and putting the cultural uh, the highlight on the cultural uh, legacy of, of the city, yes. Thank you. Um, do we, two questions? Maybe just one or no questions? Okay, oh, get in. <laughs> okay. Hi, thank you so much for an interesting panel. I have a question. Um, Biennale is like obviously the mother of all Biennales, the Venice Biennale, um, art fairs they become very institutionalized. And the discussion that you've had today really is not dealing with the commercial aspect of art and contemporary art. It's dealing with cross-cultural information, dialogue, um, relationships. So I'm curious to know when you institute site-specific works or you work within the framework of um, a city permitting agencies, is there a certain amount of cynicism from the city itself as to what they can get out of the Biennale? And I don't mean it purely as a cynical question. I'm curious to know how that process works because you want something, you want access to certain spaces in order to present the work. Do they want something in return? I'll ask that if you don't mind. There is a very strong relation between the city and the biennial. The biennial, as I was saying before, has an impact on the city. So there is an impact on um, the culture of the city. There is an impact on the economy. There is a deep economical impact of, on the city. 
be it from the people who are traveling to attend, the people who are taking places to stay, so accommodation, who are gathering. For instance, for the last one, we had 54,000 people who were coming in. Um, and the city brings something to the biennial. Most of all, when we are talking about the biennial in a public space, so the authorization to do things in the public space, some specific venues, like a building of the 16th century, you cannot just go there and say, I'm going to do it all as I want. We need the city. And, uh, and that's why there is a very, very strong relationship in between the two. I, uh, my experience is in two different cities. In the case of Bogota, the most recent project I did, um, it, there was a, an interest in the part of the city government, the, the mayor, to, to contribute to the Biennale with budget. F the main budget came from the city council because of being a new administration. And he, in a way, I suppose, wanted to instrumentalize the fact that he was supporting the arts. But that was very positive because we could make it into a public art exhibition instead of a parallel art fair. So that was, that was good. When I did the Thessaloniki Biennale in Greece in 2009, it, the crisis was already hitting Europe. And Greece was one of the first countries to, to suffer the crisis and is still, is still suffering. Um, they, one of the things that I, that I love about the, the participation of, of the city, not only in terms of funding, but also in terms of how the city used the Biennale as a, as a positive uh, occurrence, is that they have a number of historical buildings, like in North Africa, ancient buildings, that are visited as tourist sites. And we use them. We use hammams. We use public baths for the artists to intervene uh, with, with video art. And we didn't touch the, the walls because they're heritage buildings. We had to be very careful, but we could put video art and uh, things that were uh, more floor-based. And people, the, the buildings were getting more visitors uh, during the Biennale. We were getting more visitors too uh, to the normal exhibition venue because of the place being an historical site. So we put together two sorts of worlds, interest. And that I found very interesting, that the city benefited in terms of the regular tourist who goes to see the ancient baths, encounter something he didn't expect, and that the art public gets to know the history of the city. So in that way, I think it's always positive for a city to be a venue for, for a Biennale. Does that answer your question? Thanks so much, Gabriela, Ayla. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Thank yeah. you for coming. Thank you very much.